Hello again. Apparently, I did not realize that uh, recording or capture recording software I'm using is only limiting me to make recordings that are only 30 minutes long. And then it cut me off mid sentence. Um, but in this second half of the video, I guess I'm sorry, this is so unprofessional. But in this second half of the video, I will, I guess, continue with my story uh, where we left it off before. And the story was dropped at the question of, are we going to consider Native Americans as citizens under the 14th Amendment? And are we going to uh, have some, I guess, uh, are we going to require them to fulfill a particular kind of criteria before we can give them the privilege of American citizenship? And this is what the government came up with. OK, we are going to uh, pass a specific law known as the Dawes Act, named after a person, uh, I think he was like a senator, uh, Senator Dawes from the state of Massachusetts, who, by the way, was also the chair of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So this federal government institution in charge of handling questions on Native American policies. Um, and specifically on the Dawes Act, the government will say this. Um, we are going to break up the um, land that used to belong to Native Americans into smaller sections, into smaller parcels, into smaller amount of acres. And portion of these parcels or uh, an assigned amount of acres, we will give them to the Native American families. And if they lived on that territory that the government gives them, we can consider them as American citizens as long as they turn these territories into farmland. Um, so as long as they are staying in this territory forever, and if they want and if they decide to practice agriculture in this territories and to use the words of the law itself, uh, we're going to give the land to Native Americans for farming and to for them to quote, adopt the habits of the civilized life in exchange for American citizenship. What's important for you to note from this, uh, I guess, statement that you, if, if you want American citizenship, you have to quote, adopt the habits of civilized life. We can look at this quote with having some sort of like condescending undertones in that American government is assuming that however Native Americans lived before was not civilized, was not civil, because it did not fit neatly into the explanation of what America thinks is a civilized way of life. And part of the acceptance of having quote unquote civilized life is of course, not only farming the land, as opposed to maybe migrating, following the seasonal patterns, like some Native American societies had done, but also we see the continuation of what American government was trying to do before uh, by putting Native American children into uh, American-led schools where they would abandon their traditional Native American ways of life. So this is all part of the same policy and requirement for the Native Americans to be granted the privilege of American citizenship. On top of uh, regulating requirements for citizenship, American government will also seek to regulate religious life of Native Americans as more and more people are settling into the West. And there would be many incidents um, involving conflict between the government um, and Native Americans whose religious liberties will now be limited. In roots of one of these incidents, I will just speak to you about the most prominent one, the most uh, prominent in terms of how many people it's going to impact. Um, the roots of this conflict 
can be traced to an individual known as Vovoka. And he was a member of the people known as Paiute. And he lived, and him and his people lived in the state of Nevada. Again, also part of these territory sections of the Central America that American government is trying to populate. And Vovoka was uh, a shaman, meaning he was a person with um, a special, I guess, protections within the Native American uh, society, because we think of shamans or some Native Americans think of shamans as being or, or as having these almost supernatural powers, having these transcendental experiences in which they are believed to have the power to communicate with the spirits. So they are kind of seen um, within some Native American religions, shamans are, uh, the shaman is a title, right? As a person who has the power to communicate between the people and divine powers. But anyways, in one of, he, in, in one of his visions, Vovoko claimed that he was visited by a spirit who told him that Native Americans have to start performing this special ceremonial dance at each cycle of the new moon called the ghost dance, right? And um, if this dance was performed, then everything would be better in the lives of Native Americans. So this is kind of like a prayer for manifest if you, if you perform this dance at the full moon right this is almost like the prayer for the uh you're trying to manifest the um, elimination of all of the bad things that happen to your people as a result of the american government's policies so maybe if you perform this dance maybe the buffalo would return to nevada Maybe the white settlers would leave Paiute alone. Maybe we will not have to go to boarding schools. So that you're, you're performing this dance because you're hoping that it's going to help you uh, to, to make your, it's going to help your society to prosper, right? And as the time went by, we will have other Native Americans, aside from just Paiute of Nevada, who will hear about this message who will hear the words of the vision of Vavoka, uh, and they will start to gather to perform the ghost dance. So they will start to gather for days of dancing, of singing. Basically, it's like a religious observance, right? Um, however, as you may imagine, these religious celebrations will eventually catch attention of the American government um, the authorities of the government will, of course, dislike the dance because they disliked Native Americans practicing their religion freely. And specifically, we can pinpoint at one incident uh, because in 1883, government is going to pass the so-called Religious Crimes Code, which was a law that will say you cannot perform any religious ceremonies, including the ghost dance, and it will state that authorities will have the right to arrest people if they were caught performing religious dances. Now, you may pause for a second and think, wait a minute, don't we have the First Amendment right to freely express our religion? Don't we have the First Amendment right to practice religion freely? And you are right. Um, however, at this time, government is not so concerned about the First Amendment rights of Native Americans because we are still iffy whether or not they actually are American citizens. So does constitution really apply to them? And number two, we are, cons we are considering these religious dances as a threat to national security, right? We are policing uh, uh, the behavior and we are telling that these religious dances are inciting riot and disorder, right? So um, we are not really concerned about protecting religious liberties. 
And Native Americans will defy this policy, this religious crimes code, citing that they too have First Amendment rights uh, that, you know, is supposed to also protect their free practice of religion. And for that reason, as a sign of defiance, will continue to perform religious dances as a sign of protest. Now, one of the groups staging the protest are a group of people that you see on the slide, uh, Lakota, whom we actually see performing that dance. And in the 1890s, they will organize a protest, gathering hundreds of people to perform the ghost dance at the place called the Wounded Knee, which is in South Dakota. And you can imagine that this uh, performance would eventually catch attention of the government. The soldiers of the American government would arrive to the Wounded Knee in South Dakota. They will start firing shots at Lakota who were performing this dance. And in the process, kill between 150 to 200 people, most of whom were simply women and children gathering for religious observation. And this massacre, of course, speaks volumes to us about this intense relationship between um, the American government and Native American groups in late 19th centuries. And of course, it shows us how Native Americans will try to use their religion as a form of political activism, even if that means we are at the threat of losing our lives but we are trying our best to preserve our culture and we're trying to act against policies um, that are wishing to erase the Native American traditions. Now, lastly, if we were to look back at the overall topic of today's conversation, the overarching theme of how the West changed after the American Civil War. We have mentioned earlier how extraction of bison was one of the main targets of the white settlers in the 1870s. We've seen how we are starting this dispute and this conversation over limiting um, the rights of Native Americans. But it also, it won't be just bison and gold and profit and killing and murder that would be the driving force behind the settlers migrating to West and trying to capitalize on those resources. Because we will also have two different kinds of major industries who will or that will fuel this new expansion and fuel the Western economy. And here we are talking about the railroads industry and the ranching industry. And the two are kind of connected, right? Because in the post-war period, particularly 1870s, 1890s, the railroad business is going to attract enormous amounts of capital and government will pick up the pace and they will start to subsidize the building of the railroads, meaning government will say it is in the interest of American government to have uh, transportation systems across America figured out. And we think a good starting point is to expand the railroads. So we, by subsidize, I mean government will give money and contracts work contracts to private companies to build, in this case, railroads for America. For one of the first um, railroads that, or, or, or the first railroad that will connect American East to the American West is the so-called Transcontinental Railroad. And you see it on the map here, on this upper map, as this line stretching from uh, Nebraska all the way to the state of California. 
And the building of this railroad starts in, in the middle of American Civil War, when we are also concerned about the logistics. How can we transport people? How can we transport supplies? So in 1863, the government is going to give contracts to two different companies, first of which was Central Pacific a company based in California, and the workers from this uh, company were supposed to start building the railroad from side of California, and they were to meet with um, workers of the Union Pacific, who were the workers contracted in Omaha, Nebraska, to build the railroad from the eastern side of America. And the completion of the railroad will take place by 1870s. Specifically, the two crews will meet in 1869, connecting the railroad. And now we are helping the course uh, and the cause of the migration to the West uh, because we are uh, providing alternative way um, to travel by using the railroad. And not only will the railroad be awesome for people who want to travel, railroads will also be a very important business investment. Because if you are having any business in the West, now you will also have reliable means, meaning the railroad, to transport whatever it is that you're trying to sell. So this is how the map of railroads looked like or the webbing of railroads looked like in 1870s. In this map in the bottom, we see the expansion of the existing railroad network by the 1890s. Uh, or the, the, that's how railroads looked like by the 1890s. And the more railroads you have, the more business you have. Um, and especially if we look at the West, Ranching business will be will be coming, ranching and cattle will become uh, one of the more profitable businesses to get engaged in if you lived in the American West at the turn of the century. And finally, when you think about the vast landscapes um, of the West. You may typically think of um, you may typically think of men, right? Maybe this image of cowboys who are men pops into your head. Um, we think of these prototypical cowboys navigating the ranching business, you know, riding horses, feuding with Native Americans. However, we know that the frontier was also a home to numerous pioneer women whose stories don't necessarily match these standard stereotypical like Hollywood portrayals uh, that we have in our popular imagination that all cowboys are men, right? By the way, I used the term pioneer earlier in the introduction. When I say pioneer, that simply refers to anyone who ventures out who is adventurous and wants to, in this case, move west. And while it's true that west largely remained male-dominated society, there would also be thousands of women who will take advantage of the Homestead Act. You may remember I said that the Homestead Act also invited women to participate, and there will be thousands of women who will take advantage of that law. And the only requirement was that you cannot, if you're a woman, to apply to for the Homestead Act um, is that you could not be legally married, so you could not be living with a husband, uh, so you would have to either be single or you would have to be widowed. And in those cases, you could travel west by yourself and you could stake a claim into uh, the pro and, and become a property owner, right? Now, we have to pause and think that the fact that we are allowing women the freedom to travel and to be property owners is very significant because in the rest of the country, so not in the West, women were historically not allowed to be the property owners. It was typically their fathers or their husbands who were the owners of the house in which they lived in, right? And aside from allowing women 
the privilege of the property ownership in the West. The Western territories were generally more progressive in terms of women's rights. So for example, um, women living in some of the territories of the West, like Wyoming, like Utah, like Colorado, Idaho, Arizona, they will have the right to vote in the local elections. And this was true during the time when, again, women in America do not have the right to vote yet. Also, aside from these political rights, um, women had more economic independence. They didn't have to rely on their fathers or husbands for money because in the West, they were equally competitive um, on the job market. And they may apply to have some of the quote unquote men's jobs like being ranchers or being business managers, maybe opening and owning your own business. And typically in the West, women would be managing hotels, managing boarding houses or restaurants or cafes, or even in some cases, own their own ranches and be women who are tending to the cattle and pr profiting from the ranching business. Now, the question you may now ask is why are we like making that exception for women in the West? Why would settlers in the West be open to accept women and see them as equal to men? And we are not allowing that in the rest of the country. And the reason is that um, West was very sparsely populated, meaning we don't have too many people rushing to drop everything and just start new life in the West. It's a big risk, right, to pack up your belongings, leave everything and go into the great unknown. And if somebody was willing to do that, they were typically men, right? So simply there aren't enough people and not enough women in the West. So we are allowing women in the West to be property owners, to enjoy other forms of gender equality, because we want to encourage more women to move West. So it's kind of like, you know, a practical decision. And I'm okay with that because at least it meant that women could enjoy a particular level of gender equality. Now you're staring at the example of one of the prominent pioneer women because um, there were numerous of women who will own property in the West to provide story behind just one of them. I love the story of Maria Rita Valdez, the resident of California. And if you look at the picture of her, you may conclude that she may have been of mixed racial ancestry and you would be correct. She was actually Afro-Latina. She was a great granddaughter of one of the first settlers of uh, the city of Los Angeles, who was from Spain. And she was also a great granddaughter of a formerly enslaved person. So she was also, um, not only did she have mixed racial ancestry, she would also marry a Spanish soldier but she would become a widow. And as a widow, she was eligible to purchase property in the West. And she will buy 4,500 acres of land near the city of Los Angeles. And there she's going to build and manage her own ranch known as Rancho Rodeo de las Aguas. Um, and today, if you go to Los Angeles, there is a street called the Rodeo Drive, named after the ranch of Maria Rita Valdez. And today it's a home to the fanciest department stores, the fanciest designer names you can ever imagine, right? Um, but back then, before all these fancy stores were there, when Maria Rita Valdez was still alive, her ranch will employ dozens of different workers, so cowboys, ranchers, who will help to tend to the cattle and to raise cattle and horses alongside with Maria Rita Valdez. 
and things are kind of running fairly smooth smooth for her she it was very profitable ran she was very prosperous for a while however after a few years of running this successful ranching business there's going to be a couple of outlaws who will come and rob her ranch frequently stealing her cattle these kinds of ca uh, raids and and uh, burglaries essentially were unfortunately very frequent in all of the ranches and these frequent raids and shootings and violence will eventually force Maria to sell her ranch to another owner. Regardless, her story, I think, is still important to us because um, here we see women as actors, as movers, as shakers of history, and Maria's story also kind of challenges this notion of a typical Wild West as a society uh, led by men and only influenced by men and their decisions and their, their choices, right? Okay, so this, this concludes our conversation of the American West. We have taken a look at um, how the, the reasons for the settlement, how the government sponsored the settlement, the consequences of it for environment, for Native Americans, as well as aspects of ranching business that was also uh, capitalized upon um, after the American Civil War. As always, 